So I, I think on that note, um, I will now hand it over to David, an actual Texan, <laughs> who can maybe comment on some of those trends or um, yeah. or on political participation in rural areas. I, yeah, I mean, I definitely want to t- talk about the Texas stuff. And I, I just also want to note, though, I really love what you said about, you know, the burning strategy to bring in new voters is something that is going to be really important going forward. And it's really important to note that even though we should take lessons from what happened in 2016, 2020, um, that the primary campaigns are very unrepresentative of the American voter as a whole, right? Like, yeah, the Bernie strategy is to bring a lot of new voters. And that's actually going to be a lot harder to do in a primary than in a general. Um, you know, so just like, you mm-hmm. know, that's something to give us hope if we want to continue with right. the strategy. Um, but the, the Texas stuff was a, was a complete disaster. And if you're, if you're in Texas or hell, like a lot of other states in the South too, there has been this fixation with like, you know, the new South and like demographics as destiny, which in a lot of ways has just made Democrats like extremely lazy um, in their politics, right? Because they're like, okay, we don't have to win over these states. Uh, They're just going to be given to us by, you know, by Providence. And yeah, what you saw in, uh, you know, in this most recent election was that, you know, it it should be noted too, because I just don't want to mislead people that those uh, districts, those areas, in the Rio Grande Valley that did see swings towards Trump were still overwhelmingly went to Biden, right? right, right. But the fact is, is that this is like, if you want to win in Texas, you have to, you have to run up the score in mm-hmm. those areas. And basically, you know, the Biden campaign completely fumbled, uh, fumbled the ball. Um, and, and, and what's so frustrating about not just, um, you know, the failure to be able to speak to people's, you know, material interests to do that kind of real work to br- bring people to the polls was the fact that the state party and the national party completely refused um, to listen to pe- activists and organizers mm-hmm. in those areas who were saying, hey, we need y'all to show up because mm-hmm. something's happening here. And it goes to that point that you were making, which is that wealthy elites right, are much closer to the political process or they have their issues, you know, uh, addressed more than working class people. And that even goes, uh, you know, to like the the Democratic Party in kind of like, you know, cynical, um, you know, calculations that they're making, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, to try to win a presidential election. They're actually still going to ignore, um, you know, this group of people who they, you know, rhetorically are saying they support. even at the risk of you know, like Donald Trump, you know, run up the score on, right. on Joe Biden in, 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 in Latino areas of Texas is absurd. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, just to put it out there, it wasn't just Latino areas in Texas. Yeah. Um, the New York Times, if anybody is interested, sort of released some detailed maps um, over the course of the last few months. Um, a lot of immigrant neighborhoods, again, like you said, it's not that they turned red. They mm-hmm. still, you know, voted for, ended up voting for Biden. But the shift between 2016 and 2020 um, is troubling. Or, I mean, it mm-hmm. should be troubling to the Democrats if they want to keep winning. Um, because I think that, you know, a, a, Again, Democrats are still safe in those areas, but like for how much longer? Well, and I, I think so too. And it's also, I mean, there, there's a couple things that you have to note. Like, and this is true of a lot of states in the South, but particularly in Texas, like the Texas project of turning Texas into a solid Republican state, you know, was the brainchild of Rove, right? Mm-hmm. Something that he was actually laughed out of like Republican meetings uh, when he was suggesting it. Um, it was a solidly blue state, state mm-hmm. for a really long time. And they made a concerted effort to to win over the growing suburbs mm-hmm. uh, and the evangelical community, you know, to such an extent that now, like a lot of people, don't are surprised to find out that Texas has not been solidly uh, Republican for right. you know for most people's lifetimes. Um, and 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 one thing that's really dangerous about what the Democratic Party is is doing, which again gives us an opportunity to build socialist politics as an alternative to it, is they are doing this. They are essentializing people. Mm -hmm. Um, to such an extent that they don't recognize that while people do like identify as certain like ethnic groups or racial groups, right. They also are a part of the entire state's culture and community in the way that everybody else is. Right. right? right. Which means that they're going to be attracted to some of the things that, you know, anyway, you know, that like the Republicans might be selling or rhetoric Mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if you're not going out there and trying to win over those votes, you're basically, you know, just, you you know, you're just sitting them out there uh, for Mm -hmm. them to be swiped away by the Republican party. Right, and right. you can't do that 
uh, with what's happening in this country. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if, if the Democrats think that demographics are destiny, it's going to be a really dark time uh, for the next few decades because we're right. seeing everything we're seeing is trending in the opposite direction. Right, exactly. Um, and and before, um, before you get to your segment, I just want to make one last point that, um, uh, you know, I, I think that, I think that, I think that, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Oh, <laughs> um, I, I, I guess I was going to say, I, I, uh, I, you know, the project of winning rural voters, mm -hmm. um, I, like I said before, I, I think that we have to just continue the project. I don't think that there's any alternative, but that said, I also recognize how incredibly difficult it is. I mean, lots of rural voters don't want to go near any politician that has a D mm -hmm. next to their name right now, mm -hmm. you know, or I mean, um, maybe I, I, I guess, like you said, it's, it, it was a long process of getting voters to that point, uh, efforts made on, on the part of the Republican party, but also the Democrats increasingly abandoning those areas. So it's kind of difficult to know how we're going to reverse the turn. Um, mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I you know, I, I think one of the things that is is most important to to note is basically, you know, the main thrust of your your segment is that a lot of people who are, uh, you know, a lot of working class people, a lot of people just don't follow politics, you know, particularly closely. Um, and as much as they do, a lot of these people are voting defensively. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I said this to you when you were on Left Reckoning, but, you know, when you talk, and, and as you were noting too, you know, people are very fond of, you know, more government spending and these programs. Um, but they actually, they don't believe that you can do it. Right. And why would they, right? Because if their entire life has been punctuated uh, with things just getting worse, mm -hmm. um, as people come into their communities every four years or whatever and promise them that things are going to get better, why would you think that politics is right. going to be a productive way to spend your time, right? That's why, you know, a lot of those have, you know, communities have very informal, right? They're not organized in the way that a lot of socialists romanticize, but very, you know, um, right, right. very, very comprehensive, like community support networks, right? Because they understand that we're the only ones who are going to be able to do it for ourselves, right? The, the real task that we have is to convince people that, you know, politics can change their lives and that we actually have, uh, you know, a political program that's not just right, but is is winnable. And I think that mm -hmm. that's one thing that uh, especially people who have come into like more socialist politics through Bernie Sanders, um, uh, you know, are really going to, uh, you know, are really going to need to, uh, you know, start preparing themselves to understand that it's not just about having the right argument for why we need Medicare for all. You really right. need to start proving to people that you can do it because most right. people are politically depressed and they don't believe you when you say uh, that these things can happen. Right. I have to right, adjust exactly. my camera real quick, okay. sorry. <laughs> um, well, I mean, on that note, I actually think that's a pretty good segue to your segment about class and uh, how we should be thinking about it. So yeah. take it away. Yeah, so that sounds good. I mean, you know, there's no doubt that talking about class in, in the United States is extremely, um, you know, can be extremely difficult. Um, it's something that can be a lot easier to do at the societal, um, at the societal level. But it's not something um, that once you start putting the microscope on it, it becomes very, very difficult to understand. And a big part of that is because if you grow up in the United States, you've learned to really think about class as like more of a cultural phenomenon uh, than a than a political or social economic uh, phenomenon. Um, you know, and in the United States, especially, that's going to be very true because so much of our politics is filtered through this kind of a cultural lens. You know, frankly, many people have replaced a class with cultural symbols, tastes, and preferences, and that's extremely unhelpful. I mean, this is a country that has over 300 million people in it. Um, people have very shared and unique histories. People have all sorts of different relationships to property and work. We have property owners, gig workers, etc. You know, the list goes on and on and on. America, the melting pot. We all know the cliche. But socialists understand and really need to advocate for this idea that it's not only useful, but politically strategic to work to untangle class and that discussion around class from society. To do socialist politics, we can't think of class in terms of cultural affects or consumer choices or, frankly, even tax brackets. We have to understand these as distinct material relationships. And, and so much of the way that we talk about class in the United States has very little to do with politics. Let me give you an example. 
think about this pseudo conflict we had uh, after the January 6th chapter, right? Where you had Trump super fans storming the Capitol building. Uh, we have this spat here between Anderson Cooper and Sean Hannity over the Olive Garden. Of, of, of completely unpatriotic, completely against law and order, completely unconstitutional behavior. It's stunning. And they're going to go back, you know, to the Olive Garden and to their the Holiday Inn that they're staying at in the Garden Marriott. And they're going to have some drinks and they're going to talk about the great day that they had in Washington. And they really did something and stand up for something. And they stood up for nothing other than mayhem. And, and a man who is, you know, in the despicable waning days of a failed president. There's nothing wrong with Olive Garden. Let me just give a plug for Olive Garden. I like Olive Garden. I like their, their salad, unlimited, uh, unlimited uh, garlic breadsticks that are phenomenal. Some nights you get unlimited pasta. They got these hot donut-like things that you put like chocolate sauce or caramel on. Great. Really delicious. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just, it's so good. And it's ex especially juicy when you remember, you know, that these are two multimillionaires, you know, Sean Hannity, you know, decades long host. Um, and, you know, Anderson Cooper, a literal member of, you know, the Vander, you know, member of the heiress, uh, sorry, the, um, the son of an heiress of the Vanderbilt family, right? That's how so much of class politics is sort of waged in, in the United States in this kind of very fake, very empty rhetorical battle between brand preferences, right? Oh, the left doesn't like Olive Garden. Oh, strong working, you know, hardworking folks like Sean Hannity, uh, you know, prefer the Olive Garden. I mean, it's completely ridiculous. And this whole thing is a joke. These conversations obviously drive cable news and a whole host of political discourse in this country runs the exact same plays. And the real problem with this is not just that it's ridiculous and doesn't get us anywhere. It doesn't, the working class doesn't gain anything from this kind of political theater. But this kind of understanding is present everywhere. Class in the United States in its co common colloquial usage can be just as confusing. You know, people use it oftentimes to describe individual attitudes or dispositions. You know, think about a common example. Someone who is well-spoken or generous, you say, oh, that person has class. But even more damaging, um, you know, than just that is that when people talk about class, not as an economic relation or a political one, but as a cultural one, we use things like clothes, mannerisms, interests to be the pure representatives of, of class, not economic positions or job status. Think about these kind of pseudo conflicts we see all the time in the American, you know, in American pop culture, McDonald's versus Starbucks, Walmart versus Trader Joe's. There are whole cottage industries devoted with pumping up these kind of pseudo class wars in the country um, that are solely defined by people's relationship to cultural products. That kind of usage is essentially divorced from any particular political strategy or normative principles. And we see this in political speeches of free marketeers and even progressive do-gooders. When it's not that kind of analysis, making distinctions between individuals and their associated class status is nearly always put in terms of linear increases of stuff. You know, that stuff is almost always wealth, which don't get me wrong, is a pretty good start. You know, we can understand concepts like if you make $20,000 a year, you may be, you may be poor right? If you're making 150,000 plus, you may be rich. But the starting and end points of these measurements get really unclear and they get very murky in the middle. More later on why this matters. This kind of thinking really obscures class, the actual social and economic relationships between people that get at the heart of what class really is in a capital society. The socialist approach to understanding class to put it very crudely, is to distinguish between the haves and the have-nots. Or if we're going to put it more precisely, to make the distinction between those who own the productive, wealth-generating apparatuses and structures in society and those who don't, and therefore need to sell their ability to work, to gain access to the means of sustenance. I'm talking about food, shelter, clothing, medical care. Listen to this. Do you own a business and make your wealth off of the labor of others? Or do you have to show up to work every day to labor under the supervision of a boss or manager? We have this first quote up here, uh, Kale, uh, to put it as simply as possible. 
from the great Eric Owen Wright. The significance of class is that what you have determines what you have to do to make a living. If class is devoid of meaning, what it really becomes about is brand preference or affectation. Frankly, politics is just going to be about the culture war. And that is very preferable if you're at the top of this society, materially benefiting from capitalism and want things to stay the same. But if you want to fundamentally change the society and not only improve working people's conditions, but bring working people into power, we have to avoid the substitution of class for culture. It has to also be said that just because we are all in a class location in capitalism does not mean that one acts consciously only in the interest of everyone in that class. As individuals, we typically look out for ourselves and those we care about. That's only natural. There's nothing that automatically is going to bring people in solidarity with each other. There's potential, but it's not a given. Building a working class that is actively conscious of itself and fighting for its political interests is a process. It's not something that's going to be ready made for us, and we're going to have to build it. That's why the mater this materialist analysis is really important to building socialist politics. But the left also has to be wary of an exclusively uh, a cultural analysis of class. Decades of the neoliberal war on the working class have been fueled by the concept of a culture of poverty. The idea that people are poor, not because of the structure of capitalism, but because they have a bad cultural or moral failing that produces poverty. From both the Democratic and Republican Party, this conception has caused great harm to working people while also successfully moving the debate over poverty in the United States from the economic sphere to the cultural and personal. That was a major influence on Bill Clinton's disastrous move to change welfare as we know it. But that's no relic. Check out this report from Obama's Commerce Department that was put together in the midst of the financial crisis to the then Vice President and now President Joe Biden. So this uh, report analyzed what it means to be middle class in the United States. And they said, Middle class families are defined by their aspirations more than their income. The Commerce Report assumes that middle class families aspire to home ownership, a car, college education for their children, health and retirement security, and occasional family vacations. <laughs> Again, that's them, that's the liberals defining class solely through the products that people can consume. It gets nowhere close to making that serious analysis between people who have to work to survive versus people who don't have to work and are able, able to reap off and benefit from the labor of others. And these definitions have had serious consequences for the working class. And I think that most leftists and socialists are fairly well versed in what has happened with that kind of liberal war on the, uh, you know, the culture of poverty. But we've seen this new development. Um, regarding the a cultural conception of class that has really been proliferating amongst the left, you know, where people are calling out structural barriers that the working class faces as classist, which can make the struggle against capitalism appear as if it could actually be overcome if there were just more sympathy and understanding by the ruling class to the working class. I'll tell you right now, this perspective is severely lacking in the understanding of power. Certainly many rich people have a general aversion and contempt for working people. That's very true and it's disgusting and we should call it out. But the main problem with bosses is not that they are classist against you. The problem is that they pay you less in wages than you make for them in profit. Now, you may be saying, why does this matter? Why do we need to know who's in what class? And I promise you that this is not just an academic definition. There are serious political implications of knowing what someone's material interests are, knowing if somebody um, is directly tied uh, to capitalism as a whole, to this system that we're living in. Um, that is good information to have to understand whether or not you should try to organize that person. You might fail to convince a worker, or you might find an occasional class trader coming from the ruling class to your side. But by and large, class is what is going to set the fault lines of this battle. There's a big step, for example, between recognizing that you are getting screwed by your boss and recognizing that you are a member of a class that has been getting screwed your whole life. And in fact, 
that class that you are a part of has been getting screwed over since the beginning of capitalism and that you need to take collective action to fight back. Our opponents benefit from obscuring this dynamic. That's why you see this kind of theater between people like Cooper and Hannity. They'd rather see society engage in endless culture war while they wage a class war unimpeded. People are rightfully frustrated and angry about their lives. The culture war is a perfect way to capture that energy and to divert it. Capitalism alienates us from one another and makes us feel that this is the best it can get, but it's not. We have, to, we have the power to and can build a better world. And it's the job of political organizers to bring people together around a working class political project based on people's shared material interests. Class conflict is happening all around us and we need to make that conflict political. So I, I feel like I should uh, take the question that you asked me when I came on Left Reckoning, which is how do we move from culture war to class war and direct it back at you? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the first thing that we have to start you know, doing, and a, and a lot of socialist organizations uh, do this, but we really need to try to frame all of these fights that we're having in politics as as class fights, right? Um, so, for example, when we complain about somebody like Jeff Bezos, right? Um, you know, there are people uh, you know who has more money than God, right? Absolutely disgusting. When we can make challenges to them and say, like, oh, why doesn't Jeff Bezos, you know, invest more in fighting homelessness, right? Or you know, any you know, sub in any billionaire to that situation. Well, to understand why would they? Because they use homelessness as a tool to be able to exploit workers all across the spectrum. Amazon would not be able to keep people in those horrible conditions that it keeps people in if they did not have the specter of homelessness and hunger that come with unemployment in the United States, right? And taking that second level uh, analysis, um, I think is something that's gonna be really important for us to do rhetorically because like most people are against inequality like, you know, as like mm -hmm. a concept, right? Oh yeah, that's unfair. But people really need to understand that not only does inequality play a structural role and there's a reason why it exists, uh, but it also exists to, you know, to hurt you, right? To keep you down, to put you in a certain perspective. Mm -hmm. I think in addition to, you know, the various uh, elites, uh, your Anderson Coopers and Hannity's who, you know, kind of foment the culture war in order to like keep their ratings up or to, you know, put on a show or whatever. Um, it, it also occurs to me that that the Democrats and the Republicans, by and large, also engage in culture mm. war um, by by, you know, um, uh, I mean, there's stuff like, of course, like abortion and, you know, immigration, which you can think of as as cultural issues. Um, but then, of course, you know, the Democrats, again, are seen, I think, not, sometimes not wrongly as kind of the party of like the, you know, uh, like arugula eating <laughs> elites or whatever, who are like looking down on like real heartland Americans who mm -hmm. are... I don't know, like driving pickup trucks or whatever. Um, and I and and I'm not saying that's a good that's a good sort of you know conception or model to like <laughs> like build politics off of exactly. But but how do we get around that? Because I do feel like since we're talking about rural voters, there mm -hmm. is a sense which again I don't think is completely misplaced that like oh the Democratic Party is not for me. Like these people like don't respect me. You know. Oh yeah, and yeah, and I, I mean, like again, it's one of those things where obviously, you know, they they don't. And I think mm -hmm. the advantage that we have as as socialists and doing the kind of organizing that we're able to do is that we don't have to paint a picture mm -hmm. um, that like Kamala Harris has your interest. Like we can go into those <laughs> conversations and say, yeah, you're hundred percent right. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, Ted Cruz is a monster mm -hmm. um, as as well, right? And you know. And the way that these guys try to play working class people on, on TV is, I think most people actually even understand that it's for show. Yeah. Um, to, you know, so it, it goes both ways. But um, I, I mean, for for like a lot of the liberals, um, you know, it, again, it's so deep in that culture that they don't actually want to traverse it, even if they think it would, you know, mm -hmm. get, them, get those those kind of votes. I think one is, um, you know, to push back against uh, these kind of false narratives. You know, for example, that like, you know, just to talk about kind of culture that I'm familiar with, you know, places mm -hmm. where I'm from, you know, which is like, you know, white Southern guy, right? Um, you know, country music is not 
ignorant, right? Mm -hmm. It's not reactionary. It has a very radical history. Um, and it has a history that has been completely co-opted. So if you like Willie Nelson, right, you should be standing with the American indie movement. If you like Chris Christopherson, hell, he supported the Sandinistas, right? Like these, these stories um, have been sold to us, especially over the past like 30, 40 years to completely obscure of the radical nature mm -hmm. of, of these regions. And I actually think to dig even deeper than just kind of like, you know, pop culture icons or, you know, uh, music icons, all of these communities have really deep, uh, you know, radical roots too. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, something that Matt and I always say on, on Left Reckoning is like, if you were trying to organize in your community, learn a little bit about, you know, what was happening there a hundred years ago. And more often than not, you're going to find like a labor struggle. If you're able mm -hmm. to root it in something that is like familiar to people, right? Mm -hmm. And say, hey, this ain't some foreign idea. This isn't some idea that's coming from another part of the country. This is like, this is the soil, the place that you live in. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're going to have a lot stronger of a, you know, of a, uh, you yeah. know, of a rhetorical appeal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And it reminds me of two things. One, uh, when the West Virginia teachers went on strike, uh, a lot of them referenced uh, coal miner families uh, mm -hmm. that they came from who, you know, had gone on strike decades prior. Um, and I don't know if you remember a big thing uh, uh, was that they would wear the red bandanas as an homage to mm -hmm. the coal miners of, of, you know, prior generations. Um, and the other thing is, um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna run this Jennifer Silva interview in a little bit. And one of the things she talks about is in this depressed uh, Pennsylvania coal country, a lot of the people who were struggling did have these, you know, sort of labor history backgrounds, even if it had been one or two generations since mm -hmm. they were connected to them. And so you would see people saying things like, you know, again, people, people who, in some ways were very conservative or in some ways were kind of like anti-government would also say things like, well, like I'm a big, I'm a big entitlements guy. Like I really, you know, like I think that the government should be looking out for people. And also like, I really like unions. And so like, there was just a lot, there are a lot of different pieces going on. And I mean, like as somebody who grew up, you know, in, in a rural area, um, who has also lived in Texas, like you must know tons of people like this who, it, I mean, it's not so cut and dry, right? Well, I mean, I think, you know, one, one of the most, it, it's just something that I oftentimes, you know, try to draw like some, you know, some encouragement from, um, was remember spending time with, you know, with friends and, and, and families, uh, you know, when I was in, when I lived in South Carolina, I lived in a very poor community. Right. Um, and, and, you know, most of my friend's parents were truck drivers. Mm -hmm. And I remember just like sitting outside one day with everyone there drinking beer. And one of my friend's dad, who was like, you know, he was a, a right wing. I wonder if he even voted. I actually have no mm -hmm. idea um, or not. But, you know, he, he definitely wasn't like a social liberal or anything like right. that. Right. But he would often go off, you know, after a couple of beers and, you know, would be really prideful in his work. And he would say, like, if I stop working tomorrow, this entire thing would shut down. Yeah. All these other people who look down on me, these like lawyers and folks, like everything would keep on running. We could shut this entire country down in a day mm -hmm. if all the truckers got together. And I always think about it's like, you know, that's right there. I mean, that is, that yeah. is prime like labor, you know, right. consciousness, worker consciousness, um, you know, and all of those other things are, are things that, you know, we are going to have to learn from each other and like grow together and, and struggle. I've always said um, that a lot of these issues that people say, and like, you know, Adolph Reed, uh, who's done really great work in South Carolina, um, organizing specifically around Medicare for all makes this point all the time that whatever anxieties people have about sort of merging communities that might be segregated from each other in those areas, um, those like differences, they grind away pretty quickly when you get people in a room together and they start saying that they want to achieve uh, health care and they start to realize that they're all facing the same kind of, you know, problems. Mm -hmm. That's the story today as it was, you know, in, in the populist movement mm -hmm. um, as well. Right. And I just think that like, you know, um, there, there's a consciousness there that is like it's much more. Um, close to the top that I think a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, recognize. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, whatever other anxieties we have, those things um, can only be alleviated by by doing that kind of work of getting people together. 